Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, as I do with a lot of presentations, I'd like to start with a story. And the story starts in the big forest. In the big forest, all the animals gather together because they're kind of scared. The future is coming. And they've learned from the humans that the future is a scary thing that you have to prepare for. So now they're thinking, how should we prepare for the future? And then they go look at the humans again. And they see the humans prepare their young for the future by sending them to school. So all the animals in the forest agree, we need a school as well. So all the animals gather in an open circle in the middle of the forest, and they start discussing what should be in this school. Well, the deer say running. Running is the most important thing of all. But the ducks say swimming. Swimming and flying. But the squirrels say no, climbing into trees and gathering nuts. That needs to be on the program. So after three days of bickering and fighting, they come with a beautiful rounded program with climbing, with running, with digging, with swimming, and everything is in it. So the school starts after the summer holidays, because that's how school starts. And all the animals are sitting there. All the little young little animals are sitting there, the little squirrels and the little deer and the little ducks. And they're all sitting there like, what's going to happen? And the first thing that they're going to do is swimming. So the ducks are happily, merrily going through the water. The squirrels aren't as enthusiastic about this subject. But the next subject is climbing. So the squirrels are up in the tree, but now the ducks get disqualified because the ducks flew up into the tree and it's climbing, it's not flying. So they're disqualified, they get an F for the subject, and they move on to the next part. Well, you can kind of gather how this works. Because by the time that running is over, the ducks have so many sores on their feet that swimming doesn't work so well either. And at the end of the year, everybody's wondering, well, what animal is the superior animal of the forest? Who went through the school the best and is best prepared for the future? And in the end, they come to the conclusion that the superior animal in the forest is clearly the weasel. Because the weasel can swim a little, climb a little, dig a little. He can do everything a little bit. And what else could you want for a perfect student than being able to do everything a little bit? Might there be a metaphor in this story when you think about the schooling system? <laughs> um, a little step back. Um, who am I? Who are we? Um, you're here. Welcome to the information evening of the School of Understanding. The School of Understanding that's going to start on the 17th of August after the summer holidays, um, right across the street here in the building that's over there. Some of you have already walked there, I saw. And just as a quick intro, who are these people starting it up? And I'm representing the board right now. Um, our chairman, uh, Klaus Dege, who has a lot of experience uh, managing schools from single schools to complete school systems. Um, we've got Joko, who is um, spending a lot of time on housing and the childcare aspect of the program. And also, you know, how do we decorate things and how to combine those things from vision to execution. Um, we've got Johan, who is uh, primarily uh, finance and housing, but more from a structural procedural side. And we've got Jessica, who is one of our main teachers, and the teacher, teacher, and the supervisor. And this will be the team of our teachers, the four teachers we have selected. And I'll say a little bit more about how we did that, and um, myself. And to say a little bit about myself, um, I actually was a terrible student. Um, I went to three high schools and spent two years more than you should in high school before barely graduating. So I kind of vowed never to set foot in a school institution again. Well, that didn't quite pan out the way I planned it. Um, but I spent a lot of time in gifted and talented education. Um, I set up gifted and talented schools. Um, I've got a company that is guiding, we're about 15 people together that's guiding schools to set up gate, gifted and talented programs, enrichment programs, acceleration programs and stuff like that. And in that process I've learned a lot about good education. And one of the things that I saw when I was in the US um, to visit some of these gifted and talented programs that they started practicing something called teaching up. And teaching up is using methods that you, you would actually use for smarter kids for regular kids, and then they found out that the regular kids get smarter too. If you treat somebody as though he's possible of more, then he will be capable of doing more. Um, so that's kind of short 
version of where I'm coming from. I'm a board member, uh, I train the teachers, I'm part of you know, the visionary process of designing the school and networking with other people to set it up. So that's going to be my prime role. <coughs> um, what we're going to do today is I'm going to run through a presentation. It's going to be quite a lot of information, so I'm sorry for the people who brought their kids. I hope they can kind of sit through all the information. Um, some of you might have seen there's a camera in the back. I'm recording this so we can share it through the newsletter as well. So um, if you want to share it with other people as well, that's possible. Uh, that's possible too. At the end, I'll ask some, answer some questions. There are Dutch people here as well. Um, I'm going to focus it mo mainly on the English-speaking crowd. We've already had three information evenings for Dutch-speaking people, so we really want to cater to the people who are English-speaking right now. Um, some of the general principles. What should the goal of education be? Well, in line with the animals in the forest, the goal should be to pre prepare our children for the future. Uh, the problem is that the future is getting more and more complex by the day. The future 100 years ago was reasonably predictable. There's no telling what life will, be look like, what, what life will look like in 20 years or 30 years or 40 years. Um, if you want to prepare a student, what you want him or her to be able to do is want to be productive, to be able to do stuff. The second thing you want somebody to do is to contribute. We all function in society because we can all contribute to that society and that is kind of an agreement we have to society. We take care of society and society takes care of us. But one goal that is extremely important in my book is we need to teach children how to strive for happiness, how to learn to be happy. And that's actually something we're pretty lousy at. If you look at the statistics of people between 20 and 30, there have never been as many depressed 20 to 30 year olds as now, which is typical because we're actually in quite a welfare time, you know, if you look in history. I mean, we, we, we call it a crisis, but it's not like we're, we're out of food or something. So it's typical that a lot of young people have such a hard time being happy. So we think that education should prepare them for that. So what do you need to facilitate that? Um, if you really simplify um, education, you can break it down into three components. Education spends time spreading knowledge, so giving knowledge to kids, pouring knowledge into their heads so they know stuff. We teach them skills and we want to convey an attitude, a way of being in the world. If you look at most schools, they'll spend 80 to 90 percent of the time teaching knowledge. If you know the right stuff, then you'll be fine which is kind of an industrial assumption of about 100 years ago. If you have a general knowledge, then you'll be fine. And then we'll spend about 10 to 15 percent on skills. That's kind of going up slowly. And if we've got time to spare, we'll spend it on developing attitudes. But when you look at most research on employee happiness, but also um, academic success, earning potential, happiness, then it turns out that somebody's life attitude is by far the best predictor of all those factors, happiness, productivity, um, income, all those factors are mainly, um, <clears throat> are mainly connected to your ability to persevere in face of hardness, uh, to enjoy taking on challenges. So uh, having a growth mindset as they call it, uh, being a learned optimist, those are attitudes that greatly contribute to your ability to function in the world, but most schools spend virtually no time on that. And then you get the story, I don't know if you know the story about the, uh, the woodcutter who is cutting wood, uh, chopping trees, and then the guy comes by and says, you know, your axe is dull, so shouldn't you spend time sharpening your axe? And the guy's like, no, no, I'm way too busy, there's so many trees I need to cut down, I don't have time to sharpen my axe. And that's what the education system does, it pours in knowledge, and the attitude goes down, the skills go down, and then you're saying like, well, maybe you should teach them more skills and help them build their attitude. But the schooling system is like, no, we've got so much knowledge we need to pour in, we don't have time to build the skills. And this goes into a downward spiral. We want to turn it around. So if you want to summarize the School of Understanding concept in the shortest possible version is we focus on developing life attitude as a way to develop more skills and develop more knowledge to contribute as much as we can to the future of a child. So the focus of the School of Understanding is not what do you know, but who do you become? What personal development do you go through? And you know, one of the key words in there is self-awareness. How aware are you of yourself? Who am I? 
but also how aware are you of your environment? How do I connect with other people and how do I interact with other people and how do I do that? Um, what for me is impossible, uh, really important when you talk about happiness is that you need to define it because happiness might bring up the feeling for you of this happy feeling of everybody is just being happy all the time and cheerful and you know the school is one big roller coaster ride of happiness. Um, happiness is actually a pretty complicated subject, there's a lot being said about it and I want to take you through some theory to explain that and this comes from positive psychology uh, perhaps some of you have heard of it. Martin Seligman did a lot of research on it. Um, what is happiness? And what are real versions of happiness? And this is the adaptation by Tony C, who implemented in his company Zappos. But Seligman said, if you want to strive for happiness, first you need to know what it is. And he did a lot of research on it. He says there are three types of happiness. Later on he developed it into five, but there are three main types of happiness. And the lowest type of happiness is rock star happiness. Rockstar happiness is you get what you want. I want more money, now I'm happy. I want a new car, now I'm happy. I want a new house, now I'm happy. When you get what you want, you're happy. And that's why it's called rockstar happiness, because only rock stars can keep it up. <laughs> and there's just two problems with rockstar happiness. One is it doesn't last very long. They've um, shown it time and time again. People who won the lottery, within eight months, they're at the same happiness level as they were before. Regardless of how much they won, what they did with the money, within eight months you're at the same happiness level you were before. I see some people think, give me the money, I'll show you a higher return, but really within eight months you'll be at the same level. And the second problem is that you get something called happiness inflation. What is enough to be happy today won't be enough to be happy in the future. And if you doubt that, think of your first payment stuff that you ever got for your first job, for your first month work and imagine you getting that money now for the same month work and think whether you'd be just as happy when you got it the first time and when you would get it now. For most people a lot of happiness inflation has occurred, you would be quite unhappy receiving the same amount of money. The problem of most of society is that most of society is aimed at rockstar happiness. The assumption is if I get everything I want, there will be one day in my life and then I'll be happy forever. But the problem is, it's not quite true. Well actually that day comes. That day comes that you have everything you thought you ever wanted and that's the day they call the start of your midlife crisis. <laughs> because then you have everything you wanted but you're not happy. And then you're like, oh, now what? And usually you'll start looking, well actually the male solution is to get, you know, like the red sports car, the Harley Davidson and new girlfriend. And the problem is after eight months, <laughs> same problem. So you start looking at happiness at a different level. You go up to passion, flow and engagement. Uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, a Hungarian um, researcher, found that there's a state of happiness called flow, which isn't immediately gratifying. It's not the same as getting money but it provides long-term deep happiness. And it's when you do something that's challenging, challenging you at a high level in an area that interests you. And when you get that, you can stay in flow for the rest of your life. Uh, people in top fields of sports, uh, top fields of science or whatever, get into flow and can really stay there as long as they're challenged, as long as they're doing something that they are interested in. And the highest level of happiness is purpose or meaning knowing why you do something and what the meaning of it all is and the more you know that the better it is but I don't know if you've got kids in a puberty age usually they'll go way down to rocks or happiness because when they look at the school system they'll come up to you and say what's the meaning of this what's the use of what I'm learning here and probably you'll find out that you won't know an answer because a lot of times there is no real point to what they're learning apart from this is what we've done for the past 50 years and how many kids get into passion, flow and engagement? I mean, especially if you've got a gifted or a smart kid, probably the materials he gets are way too easy because he's bored. And then, no flow. So then they drop back to a rocks of happiness. As long as you kind of bribe them into doing something, they'll start doing it. But as soon as that is over, no chance of getting them to move again. So this is one of the ways of looking at happiness and by teaching this to children and by designing your school so that they will get into flow, they will see the meaning of what they're doing, they'll be a lot more self-motivated to do stuff. And a lot of schools are spending time first getting out of flow and not knowing meaning and then fighting about how to
get them moving again. And then you have to get all these rocks of happiness tricks in, and you have to reward them and punish them and stuff like that. But it's very con counterproductive. So what does this concept look like? What, what do we do? Well, when you look at the content, one of the things we spend a lot of time on is developing talents. Most schools, basically, like the story I told about the forest animals, have this average view of an average kid. And every kid is put next to that measuring bar. Are you good at being an average kid? And some people are really good at being an average kid, and some are not so good at being an average kid. The problem is, there are no average kids. Every kid has his own talents and something he's good at and something he isn't. But by only hammering on what he's not doing well and ignoring what he does do well, does not motivate kids. It does not get them happy, but it also doesn't prepare them for a future. Because why do we have a school system where you have to spend 14 years learning four different languages to be allowed to, st to study the theoretical mathematics? And why should you be obliged to get mathematics for nine years or 12 years when you want to start study literature? I mean, there, there is a point to having knowledge of how the world works, but maybe we're pushing this a little bit too far. So one of the things we want to focus on is developing of talents, and we call them the mastery subjects. Every child must choose for certain periods something they want to be good at. I want to be good at, and it can, can be as simple as the mathematics assignments I'm getting this week, but it can also be I want to be better at soccer, or I want to learn to cook. And it's not enough to get an average grade in that. You set a, an ambitious goal for yourself, and for a, a young kid, you know, a four-year-old, it'll be a week. What are you going to try to be good at this week? But as they are in the system longer, and they spend more time there, after a while they have to make a three-week goal, or four-week, or an eight-week or three months, or six months. So they have to set a goal for a longer period of time for something they want to be good at. And the interesting thing is that one, they get to develop their talents and think about what is an ambitious goal and how do I get there and get coaching on that. But the other thing is, they're forced to choose. Because now our schooling system says, after 14 years of not choosing, then you're 18 and they'll say, you know, now you have to pick what your talent is for the rest of your life. Because you have to study for four years. And that's what you see going wrong, because a lot of people start a study and stop and start another one and stop and start another one, because they don't know, and nobody ever asked them, so they don't know what the talents are. We think that a four-year-old should start developing and researching what his or her talents are. And by having them practice that choice process over and over again, including the downfall, because you have to pick for six months, and after a month you find out that the subject you picked was not something you like very much, then you're stuck with it for five months, which will teach you both how to get the most out of something you didn't maybe completely necessarily enjoy most, but it also makes you a better chooser next time because you had the consequence of that in a smaller version. So that's really important, developing mastery talents. One thing we think is very important is continuous development. And this is one of the things I also got from the gifted and talent education, where you constantly see that kids, when they get some new materials, they run through it, they're done in four weeks, and then they spend you know, half the year waiting till they get the next thing. And why is that? Because there's a practical reason that we don't have the materials for the next subject here yet. And if we do that, you know, we give them a four-year-old, the subjects of five-year-olds, and we go keep going on, then the problem is that at the end of primary school, then the kid is eight, and he's done all the materials up until 12, and then he has to wait four years until he can go to high school. We're setting up a system where this continuous development is possible. That if the kid runs out of primary school material and middle school material before the age of 12, we will offer him high school material. And we've got a setup with teachers where they can actually get guidance, counseling, and the materials, so they just can keep going at the speed that they want to. And we're going to offer enrichment programs as well. I mean, the goal isn't to get them through as fast as possible. Um, no, we're trying to build as much character and skills as possible. But we don't think that the school system should stop them when they can go th through the system faster. But for that, you need an individual digital curriculum. You need to make sure that the child is not dependent on the teacher to explain something. Because that's what most school systems are now. You have to wait till the teacher tells you, and then they tell you what page to be on in the book, and then you can do it. 
But there's no point in that. It's such an old-fashioned system with so much digital materials available. Like even YouTube is available where you can l learn pretty much any subject up until you know, the MIT level materials. So why should a teacher be explaining stuff when that time would be better served coaching kids and you learning from digital methods? So we've got from uh, mathematics to language uh, acquirement, we've got digital methods as much as possible so the kid can go at it go through it at his own pace. And we don't say that you're a five-year-old, you're only allowed to use five-year-old materials. You can do it at the level you're on. And in everything, we've got an integrated attitude development program because we believe that is more important. In any lesson, when you're le learning math, that's a moment that you can learn to be resilient and to persevere. Because when something doesn't go your way, you can learn to persevere. That's a useful skill. When you're learning Spanish or English or whatever, you can learn learning skills. So this needs to be integrated. It shouldn't be like, we've got happiness class. It's on Tuesday from 1 to 1.15. And the rest of the week, you shouldn't be happy because it's not on a program. You know, these happiness lessons should go through everything you do in every interaction. And if you want to be self-aware, it shouldn't just be during self-awareness class, but you can be self-aware during your research project as well. So it should be integrated. Um, it will be a bilingual program, uh, but, and that I don't know if everybody understands that, this is a Dutch school. And Dutch public schools are allowed to, at maximum, spend 25% of their time in a foreign language. So it will be 25% English, 75% Dutch. We will be testing the boundaries on that because we think it should be higher, but uh, formally this is the limit of the amount of English Dutch we will do. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but if you bring your kid to us um, and you're an English speaker, then we will be working at teaching your kid Dutch uh, until he can fit in in the public school system as, as we are required by law. One of the things that we do think is really important is movement as well. Um, movement is something that's severely lacking in the education system. Uh, kids need to move, actually adults need to move as well. Um, we've been trained long enough to be able to suppress that need, but uh, you've got brain gym, which are specific exercises to get you more focused and you get your brain cooperating better. And there's a special, specific program for motoric skill development, which you can also approach as opposed to saying, this kid is bad in moving and this kid is good in moving. If you look at development mental levels, if you adjust to the level that a kid is on, any kid can learn. Any kid can develop his motoric skills. So we've got special programs for that as well. No, not too much is that. There we go. Um, content. In terms of programs, we do use Singapore Math, which is internationally recognized as one of the most effective and most deep learning uh, math methods that there is in the world. And we are opting to offer it in English. So we'll actually, this will be part of our English class. We'll be teaching an English language uh, Singapore math method. Um, we'll be using a language method in Holland. We'll be using what they call Taalze Language C, which is an online learning system for language adaptation, which is completely gamified. So kids can feel like they're playing a game, but they're practicing a lot of the language skills and, and spelling skills. Um, the math version is uh, the math garden where they teach the um, optimization of their math skills in an online environment. In terms of skills, we do IPC, International Primary Curriculum. Some of you will know it if you come from an international school. It uh, doesn't mean that we are an international school, but the research projects and the world orientation projects, we will be using the IPC program. And we'll do that partly English, partly Dutch, because we've got both modules available. And the nice thing about this is that this system has a lot of the attitude and skill development integrated. Um, there's a self-learning assessment network or, or a review process so kids can review their own learning process so be, they become more and more owner of their own learning process and defining their own research questions and learning to work through them as they go through the program which also has a lot of the world citizen program in there as well like how how can i be a world citizen be connected with the rest of the world we'll be teaching the 21st century skills uh, we've got a system for that it's called the 21st century skills game um, to develop these skills from um, digital literacy to cooperation to self-awareness. 
Um, we've got a learning skills program, it's called Learn to Learn, uh, which is a complete program to teach kids studying skills, and studying skills are a very specific subject 